I'm David Thompson, and I'm proud to introduce the chapel speaker for today, who was born in the small North Georgia town of Lafette, attended Lakeview High School, and worked summers at Lake Winnipesoka as a lifeguard. In high school, he played baseball and basketball and continued playing baseball at the University of Georgia. After graduating, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. He served two tours in Vietnam as an infantry unit advisor with the Army of the Republic of Vietnam and as the executive officer of the 2nd Battalion, 8th Infantry Regiment of the 4th Infantry Division. His military experience spans command positions from company to division levels. He led platoons at Fort Hood, Texas and in Korea. He was a company commander with the 2nd Armored Division and battalion commander with the 32nd Armor in Germany. He led the 1st Brigade of the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea. He commanded the 1st Armored Division stationed in Germany and led that division into combat during Operation Desert Storm. Under his leadership, the 1st Armored Division decimated the Iraqi Republican Guard in a matter of days in the largest tank battle in American history. His staff positions included the Executive Officer to the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations and Plans, Chief of the War Plans Division, and Deputy Director of Operations. He served three years as the Army Inspector General and became the first and only Inspector General in the history of the United States to be selected to wear four stars. In his last duty position, he was the second highest ranking soldier in uniform as the Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Army. He has been decorated by several foreign countries for his service to their citizens. He wears the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry with the Silver Star, the German Army Cross of Honor, and the Order of May for Military Merit, known as the Grand Cross from Argentina. His many U.S. military awards and decorations include the Defense Distinguished Service Medal, two Army Distinguished Service Medals, three Legion of Merit Medals, and the Combat Infantry Badge. He has been awarded seven bronze stars that include the V device for courage and valor in combat and the Purple Heart. Following his military career, he continued to succeed in leadership roles at the highest levels of business and community service. He was the Executive Vice President of Military Professional Resources Incorporated and of the L3 Communications Government Services Group. He has served on the Board of Visitors for the Virginia Mil Military Institute the Board of Regents for the Uniformed Services Health Sciences University, and the Board of Directors for the Aurora Foundation. But what he is best at is being my grandfather. I had always bragged to my friends about my grandpa being a four-star general and having grenade shrapnel on his head, but it was not until I started preparing my introduction that I realized how unique and accomplished his career was. In doing the research, I realized he has fought and served in some of the most significant positions in our military history. I'm so proud to have gotten this opportunity to introduce him. Please join me in welcoming to Baylor School, my grandpa, General Ronald Houston Griffith. Well, thank you very much, and uh, David did a great job. He read it just like I wrote it for him, so. <laughs> no, I, I had not heard those remarks, and I'm both uh, flattered and honored and uh, somewhat embarrassed by the uh, extent of his introduction. But thank you for the opportunity to be here. Headmaster, Mr. Scott Wilson, Chaplain Dan Scott, distinguished faculty and coaches, and students of the Baylor School, a great, great Chattanooga Institute that, by the way, I've known about most of my life, and I go back a very long way. Uh, in fact, Baylor probably had a little bit of influence on me uh, thinking about the military, because while I didn't attend uh, Baylor, uh, my parents would bring me occasionally into Chattanooga to shop in, along Market Street and Broad Street, and I would see these good-looking cadets uh, in their uniforms, chevrons, and uh, but it was not only their appearance, but their decorum uh, that I was always impressed by. So uh, Baylor has had an influence on me as well. Uh, today my remarks uh, will, for the most part, uh, be in the context of a military 
uh, because that's where I spent my life. Uh, actually, uh, I had 43 years wearing a uniform of one sort or, or another. Uh, I couldn't go to Baylor. I couldn't wear a military, Baylor military uniform. So when I was 18, I said, well, I'll get a uniform. I joined the Marine Corps Reserves. And what I quickly learned under the supervision of some drill instructors was uh, being in the military was a lot more than wearing a nice-looking uniform. Uh, it was a rather traumatic experience to, as an 18-year-old, to experience the leadership of some very tough and demanding uh, Marine Corps drill instructors. But uh, uh, that was my experience. I uh, want to touch on just a couple things this morning. Uh, Again, I think the things I touch on, they affected me in the military in the way uh, I dealt with issues and, and, and saw life. Uh, but I think they also have application in any form of, of, of life. So I hope they'll be at least somewhat useful. By the way, I'm not naive. I've sat in audiences like this and listened to old guys talk and walked out and 10 minutes later didn't remember the thing that was said. So I'm not naive, by the way. But... Uh, I would observe that uh, as you move along life's path, uh, you're going to come to criti critical points along the way. Uh, you're going to come to decision points along the way. And those, uh, those points may be in the form of events that occur in your life, or they may be in the form of individuals who come into your life or are already a part of your life who have an influence on uh, how you uh, react to situations and how you uh, follow a given path. Uh, in the Army, we teach leaders that you do detail planning. Uh, you do detail planning for routine operations, but you really do detail planning for combat operations. Uh, you analyze the enemy, you analyze the terrain, you analyze the weather, you look at courses of actions and ultimately come up with decisions and you codify those decisions in operations orders. But once those orders are issued, you also make clear to the subordinate leaders who are carrying out those orders that it's very unlikely that everything's going to occur as you envisioned as the order was being prepared. And so you must, on the battlefield, make decisions. You must look for opportunities that you didn't envision when the orders were being uh, constructed, and you must be aware of your own vulnerabilities that you didn't realize as, as you were constructing these plans and orders. And, and I think that's true in life. You do, you do detail planning to the extent that you should be at this point in your life, and as you move on, you'll do more planning. But also be aware that there'll be people who'll come along, there'll be events come along that will push you in a given direction. And you may need to think about how you will respond and react to those changes that will occur along life's path. Uh, David mentioned I graduated from the University of Georgia. Uh, upon graduation, I, uh, I want to be a coach. I really want to be a baseball I really want to be a professional baseball player, but I found out in a couple of tryouts that I was a fairly good college player, but uh, didn't have the ability to play at that higher level. But I want to be a coach. And when I was at the University of Georgia, I prepared myself to do that. And when I came out, I went to graduate school, and I was also commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army Reserves. Uh, one of my mentors there was a gentleman by the name of Speck Towns. If you go down to the University of Georgia, you see the, the great track there that uh, is named after Forrest Speck Towns. If you don't know who he is, Speck Towns was uh, on the 36th Olympic team. He was a teammate of the great... Uh, Jesse Owens, and Speck Towns won the gold medals in the 36 Olympics. And he's a great iconic figure at the University of Georgia in Georgia's history. He was also a great person. He was one of my mentors, and in fact, he pinned my lieutenant bars on when I became, he was an officer in the reserves. He pinned my lieutenant bars on, and then he came to me when I just started grad school, and he said, uh, Griffin, how would you like to have a job? I said, yeah, I'd, that'd be kind of nice. I don't have much money. And he said, well, I got you a job over at Athens High School if you want it. He said, they're looking for a 
a young coach over there, and he said, I've got you a job over there if you want it. So I took this job at Athens High School. Back when I was at Athens High School, and I just thought about this last night. I just came back to my mind. I brought a JV traveling team from Athens to, up to Chattanooga, and we played the Baylor JV team, we played the Macaulay JV team, and we played the City High School JV team in a, about three days. And it was, it was a little travel event for those guys. I won't tell you what the outcome of the games were, but uh, again, it came back to my mind last night. But in any event, uh, I went to Athens, I coached, I liked it okay, uh, but I was restless, quite frankly. And while I was there, I ran into a gentleman by the name of Ray White. Ray White was a lieutenant colonel in the Army. He was professor of military science at uh, the high school. He became uh, a very dear friend and a great mentor to me. And he's, as he sensed my restlessness, he said, Griffith, why don't you go in, the, uh, go in the Army on active duty and try it? He said, leading soldiers is like coaching. He said, except you don't have to deal with their parents. And so uh, I found that somewhat attractive. And, uh, and uh, so I went off and uh, after a lot of thought, and it was not that simple at all, but after a lot of thoughts, I, I, I did volunteer and went on active duty. Army sent me to Fort Hood, Texas, to a tank unit, and a year later, uh, they sent me to Korea to join a tank unit uh, in uh, Korea in the 7th Infantry Division. And we were positioned, Korea at that time, by, this was 1963 and, and 62, 63. This Korea was devastated from the war. It was just terrible. Uh, people living in just the most terrible of conditions. Uh, the weather conditions, if you not been to Korea, I can assure you that it can be as cold as it can get anywhere in the world, and it can be as hot as it can get anywhere in the world, depending on the month of the year. Uh, but my unit was stationed up near just south of the demilitarized zone, and one of our missions was to patrol along the DMZ, and of course there were North Koreans control, patrolling along the DMZ, and frequently there would be firefights, and it was a dangerous situation. And it was a rugged environment for soldiers to live and train in and, and op, excuse me, operate in. But for me, I found it just enormously challenging and enormously rewarding because I said, you know, this is really, we're making a contrib contribution here. This is important stuff. And so I was, I was taken with that, and I started to think, maybe this soldiering business is, is okay. And so I had a great tour in Korea, came back, sent to another tank unit at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Uh, 1964, I was in Fort Knox, and I, uh, again, was with a tank unit there. I was a bachelor. Uh, uh, one Saturday morning, I was going up to Louisville. I had a date with a young lady. We were going to go to a movie. A young lady I'd met at the officer's club at Fort, uh, Fort Knox, and I was going to meet her that afternoon and have lunch and, and go to a movie. And as I started out of the officer's quarters, I turned on the radio of my automobile, and it must have been National Public Radio or one of the public radio stations because they announced that they were going to have a speech, a recorded speech delivered by General Douglas MacArthur uh, in 1962 at the uh, Military Academy at West Point. Uh, and I said, gee, that sounds interesting. I'll listen to that. By the way, I had heard about this speech from fellow officers who, in fact, had been present when this event had occurred, West Point uh, officers. So as MacArthur started to speak over the radio, it was, I was really captivated. And I was captivated to the point, I said, I'm going to pull over and listen to this. So I pulled into the officers, I'll never forget, I pulled into the officers club parking lot. And I sat there and I listened to General MacArthur in what became known it's the duty, honor, country speech. Have any of you heard of this? If you have, raise your hand. Good, there are several of you. Good. Uh, I would recommend, if you haven't, uh, in my view, now I'm not an English major, but in my view, it is one of the most eloquent, uh, one of the most inspirational uh, narratives that I have ever read or listened to. By the way, you can get it on, you can go on Google and you can even see MacArthur giving the speech. It's 1962, Thayer Awards, 
Uh, he was awarded the Thayer, given the Thayer Award at West Point. Uh, he was a great iconic figure in military history. He was well, well up in years. Uh, this was his farewell to the West Point, his farewell to the cadets at West Point. And he charged them throughout this very inspirational and eloquent speech about their role as leaders uh, of the military and their responsibility uh, to the nation and to the soldiers they would lead. And he continuously referred back to the sacred charge of duty on our country that they were sworn to uh, as cadets and as officers uh, in the United States military. Uh, again, I would encourage you to go back and it probably won't inspire you the way it did me, but it, it, was, it, was, it was a turning event. It was one of those events that so impacted me that <clears throat> when, when the speech was over, and honestly, I had tears running down my face. Uh, and when it was over, I said, okay, I've figured out what I want to do for the rest of my life if the Army will let me stay. And they let me stay a good long while. So it was a, a turning point for me. 1964 Vietnam was starting to crop up. We had advisors in Vietnam. Again, I was a, I was a bachelor, and I said, gee, I need to get over there because this war is going to be over before I get a chance to get over there. Little did I know that 10 years later it would still be going. Uh, so I started raising my hand and said, send me to Vietnam. And uh, the Army said, okay. Finally, they said, okay, we're going to send you. And they said, we're going to first send you to the Special Warfare School at Fort Bragg, let you run in the Special Operations Counterinsurgency Skills, and then we're going to send you to language school. And I was studying uh, Vietnamese at the Special Warfare School, and I said, I don't need to go to language school. And the Army said, no, you're going to language school. So uh, they pushed me really to do something that I didn't want to do, to go out to Monterey, California, to the, to the Defense Language Institute to study French. Uh, if you're unaware, old Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos were part of the old French Indochina Empire. And they, many, many, many of the people in that region at that time did speak French. So I studied French. But the, the event for me that was more important in learning French was uh, shortly after I got there, I met this beautiful young lady. <clears throat> she, uh, after a pretty brief courtship, uh, we got married, and she'd been with me for 51 years uh, this coming December. So uh, she's, uh, <clears throat> she, en <clears throat> she endured a lot of hardships and made a lot of sacrifices for the, for the U.S. Uh, military uh, probably more than I did, quite frankly. Uh, but we were married, got married on the 28th day of December, and on 30th December, two days later, I got on an airplane for, for Vietnam. I uh, got to Vietnam, and again, we were in an advisory capacity. We're, the combat units didn't come in, the American combat units didn't come into Vietnam until 1965. But in 64, uh, of advisory role. So I was sent with a small group, small team, a couple of non-commissioned officers, uh, and we were sent to be advisors to this Vietnamese, peasant Vietnamese infantry unit way in the far reaches of the Mekong Delta, way down in the south in the rice paddies and the mangrove swamps and uh, really a remote area in South Vietnam. Uh, this area at that time was teeming with Viet Cong, the Vietnamese communists who were uh, really uh, trying to disrupt the governments, uh, taking care of the people, and, uh, and they were very disruptive. But, uh, so we were not in big combat, but we in small combat operations almost every day uh, against the Viet Cong forces. Uh, we had one mission that was really important. Every day we had to go out and open a road. There was a 20-kilometer road that ran from this uh, agricultural region. By the way, I took David there a few years ago from this agricultural region into the provincial capital of, of, of Ben Long. And in Ben Long is where the markets were, so the, the farmers had to get their produce, their rice, and so forth to the market. And the Viet Cong would try to disrupt the roads and not let you get through. They would they'd put mines in the road, they'd put barriers in the road, they would put booby traps in the barriers. And so every day we had to go and clear the road. And normally it was just a routine operation, but on the 16th of March, 1965, it was not routine at all because 
When we went out to clear the road, the, uh, there was a large Viet Cong force laying in ambush and waiting for us. And so uh, we went into a, for me personally, the most intense fight uh, that I've ever uh, been part of. And uh, it was a very, uh, very serious uh, situation that developed very quickly. Uh, we uh, were outnumbered probably five to one. Uh, they had heavy weapons. We did. We had a couple, but not many. But anyway, the fight per goes along, and uh, the Vietnamese tried to send in air support. We got a couple of uh, fighters come in, drop bombs, and that helped a bit. And we had some artillery fires to support us, and that helped a bit. But as the day progressed, and we took casualties, and and the uh, our own ammunition was drawing low, uh, it got pretty desperate. In Ben Long, again, I mentioned provincial capital, there was a riverine force, a river salt group. And the American advisor there was a young lieutenant by the name of Dale Marcord. Uh, and Dale was listening to the radio and he was monitoring his maps and he had a keen sense of the tactical situation. And Dale said, if somebody doesn't do something, this may not turn out very well. Uh, we may lose some, some American advisors and, and some Vietnamese soldiers who uh, still have a chance if we do, if we act now. So Mark ordered his own initiative, uh, formed, it, formed this river ring group, pulled these Vietnamese together and said, we're going down and we're going to try to do what we can to rescue our friends. They came down the, Mang, uh, they came down the Mekong River several kilometers and then down this tributary, the uh, Mang Tit River, into the area where we were fighting. And as they came in, uh, Dale was on the lead boat. Uh, he was leading the, uh, the attack. He was uh, directing the maneuver of the boats, and he was directing the fires of the friendly forces. Uh, and he was hit as they came in. He was hit initially in the abdomen, and, but he continued to lead and direct the fires and direct the maneuver. Uh, but he was hit again, and he, uh, he, he died on the bow of this boat. Uh, but his force that he brought in was, uh, was successful in, in taking, relieving us, uh, taking the, the, causing, quite frankly, causing the enemy forces to panic and to flee across the river themselves. So uh, his sacrifice, we really don't know what would have happened had he not come, but we do know that his coming uh, probably saved the lives of his American friends and some great young Vietnamese peasant soldiers. Uh, I go to uh, the Vietnam Memorial occasionally, and I look at his name on the wall, and, and I always think that it always comes back to me, the biblical, uh, the biblical passage that says, Greater love hath no man than this, that man lay down his life for his brother. Uh, that's always, when I think of Dale Myercourt, that, that always comes to my mind. He was uh, given the, uh, awarded his posthumously the Navy Cross. The ship was named in his honor. Uh, still don't know why he didn't get the Medal of Honor. He should have. But uh, he was there, and he lived, the, he personified uh, the sacred vows of duty, honor, country that MacArthur talked about in his speech at West Point. After Vietnam, Dave talked about it. I went on and served a lot of places around the world. I was in uh, Germany and Korea and various other places, Fort Hood, Texas. And, but in uh, 1989, the Army sent me to Germany to command the 1st Armored Division. We were one of the NATO divisions along the front facing off against the Russians and the Warsaw Pact forces. And, and uh, as you probably recall from your history, 1989, November 89, the wall came down in Berlin. And the borders started to open up. And Germany just, I mean, it was amazing. And quite, quite frankly, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. As, as the walls opened, uh, walls came down, the borders opened, the flow of traffic from east to west started to occur. And you'd see these terrible-looking little Russian and East German cars on the, on the autobahns in Europe. And, uh, but it was just unbelievable. But what it did do, uh, again, if you followed your history, you know that a year later, uh, Saddam Hussein and his forces took over Kuwait and threatened to take over uh, Saudi Arabia. And of course, we had 
very serious national interest in that part of the world, quite frankly, at that time because of the oil. Uh, we weren't as rich in oil in the United States then as we are today, and so that oil was critical. And also it was the issue of, of, a, of a tyrant taking over another country by force. So uh, we were freed up in Germany, and in, when General Schwarzkopf went to command, uh, he asked that two of the divisions out of Germany come to the desert uh, to participate in the Gulf War of 1990. My division went. We trained in the desert. We prepared for war. Uh, uh, it was uh, an extraordinary experience. Just getting from Germany to, to, to the Saudi Arabian desert in itself was an extraordinary experience. But training there and getting prepared for war was, was another experience. But I had a great chaplain in my division, a chaplain by the name of Lieutenant Colonel by the name of Wayne Lair. And Wayne was, and his chaplains were all over the force, continuously offering the opportunity for uh, soldiers to have the opportunity, once a week at least, to, to have a worship service, to have a chapel service. And uh, he said, it's interesting. He told me one time, he said, it's really interesting, General. He said, back in Germany, we have chapel. We get, we'll maybe get 5% of the soldiers for chapel. He said, Interesting out here, we never fail to get less than 50% of a unit coming to chapel when we have a service. And so uh, he would come by every night, and the core chaplain would come by occasionally to my command post out in the desert. And we would chat, go out, walk around in the desert and chat. And one night he said, uh, are you worried? And I said, yeah, well, chaplain, I'm worried. He said, uh, well, what are you worried about? And I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm not worried about. I'm not worried about whether we're going to defeat the Iraqis or not. Uh, we're the best trained army in the world. We've got the best equipment in the world. We by far have the best soldiers in the world, so we're going to defeat the Iraqis. But I said, my big concern is how many casualties we're going to suffer uh, in the process. The intelligence estimates going into Desert Storm was that we could lose 20 percent killed, killed or, and are wounded. Uh, I had 30,000 soldiers. 20 percent of 30,000 or 10 percent of 30,000 is a, is a whole lot of uh, wonderful young lives. So that's what I, uh, that's what I worried about. And so <clears throat> he would come by every night, we'd say a prayer, and, and uh, that gave me great uh, comfort. Uh, it also reminded me that, that the things that come along in your life that you don't feel big enough to, to handle on your own. Uh, that there are, uh, there are forces that are greater than you are and greater than your ability to manage. And I, I found myself in that situation, uh, Desert Storm. I found that myself in that situation on the 16th of the, uh, uh, March, 1965, when it looked like it was all over. And so, and I'll tell you, on that, six, on that March morning, I was firing machine guns and saying prayers. Uh, and quite frankly, as I thought about the soldiers from Desert Storm, I, I said prayers for them. So I, I, I guess the point I would leave you with there, and I'm not going to give you a, uh, certainly not going to give you a, uh, a uh, sermon this morning, but I would say that, uh, as I said earlier, there are events that will come on your life that are unex unexpected. They're not what you have in your plan. Uh, hopefully there will be people there who can help you realize what's the, the appropriate direction to go. Uh, or you'll make the wise choice yourself. And uh, there will be other times where you'll face situations that you, quite frankly, don't know how to deal with. And they seem bigger than your ability to, uh, to manage. And I would just suggest to you there is a higher, higher being there that's available to all of us uh, if we so choose to, to uh, find that comfort and that support and that help. So... Uh, I've probably gone too long, but it is a pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, candidly, I envy you that you're at this point in your life with all the great things ahead of you. Uh, but there are going to be great there are going to be great opportunities, but there are going to be great, great challenges too. And I'll tell you, I think never before have we never uh, have we ever needed uh, young leaders of character and confidence and intellectual uh, capacity. And I think that's exactly what's happening right here at Baylor. And so I applaud the leadership of Baylor, 
and I applaud you young folks for your preparation for the future. Good luck and God bless you. Thank you. General Griffith has agreed to be on campus throughout the day, so you'll have an opportunity to come and meet him, speak to him. Some of you may be interested in the military academies. Uh, how shall I say this, General? Uh, you have expertise and influence. Come and meet him. He will be available during E and F in the chapel for Q&A time for those teachers, students who desire and can be here. With the help of junior leadership, you are dismissed.